Hi everybody, welcome to our <clears throat> Simple Techniques to Elevate Your Knitting Workshop. Very excited to be doing this because it's the very first workshop I've done on this page. It will definitely not be the last, but it is definitely uh, something I'm really excited to talk to you about. And um, So what we're going to be doing this evening is I'm going to cover five different techniques, which once you do them, they're super simple and they make a great difference to your knitting. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do mattress stitch. So mattress stitch is a method of seaming your knits together. I'm then going to show you a very quick look at helical knitting, which is working in spirals of knitting to avoid having those jogs in knitting. But I'll show you those in just a sec as well. And then I'm going to do some grafting versus a three needle bind off. And then I'm going to show you knitting into the backs of your stitches so that you get a little bit of extra tightness. And then I'm going to show you how to weave in your ends as you go. So five super easy things that are so easy to walk, to do. And then I'm going to talk very briefly about Knit School itself as well, because we are open for enrollment at the moment. So my dears, I'm going to switch across to my other camera and I'm going to get started because it is a Monday night and I hope everybody has their knitting. <laughs> this will be recorded as well, so you will be able to see it later. So there's no need to knit along with it or anything. Um, that would be quite tricky. <laughs> I will try not to speak too quickly either so let me so oh by the way i should introduce myself for those of us who haven't met my name is michelle gregory i'm the founder of knit school and the owner of the loveliest yarn company i'm actually in saying that i am also the dyer at banshee yarns so um i was dying over the weekend and i'd like to apologize a little bit my nails are as clean as i can get them right now they were a lot worse i looked like i had been in a murder scene um until quite recently so yes Apologies for the nails. I'm going to swap across and I will be with you in just a sec. By the way, if you have any comments or you want to say hi, I can see them as they pop up. So do say hello if you're joining me and let me know where you're from. And also if you have any questions and I can see questions while I'm on the other camera as well. So I'll do a few pauses if anyone has any questions. So with that said, I'm going to move across. So hi Joy, hello. So my dears, this is <clears throat> super simple technique um, called mattress stitching. So I have two different, two plain pieces of stocking stitch here ready to go. I have a curved darning needle and I always use a curved darning needle. I find that when I learned how to do, I, to, to curve, my, I, when I started using a curved darning needle, I found it so much easier to get finishing done. Um, so the first thing I want to do is I want to figure out which way is up because I want to, I want, to, I want to do them the same way. So before I start, I'm just going to talk a little bit about stitch construction because um, something that people you might not be aware of is how stitches are constructed. So I find it kind of useful to just talk through that first. So this is a plain piece of stocking stitch. What you're going to see is you have kind of untidy edge. Then you have a V and all your V's of stitches. So these are your columns of stitches are made up of a series of V's. So there's a V at the front. And there's the little loop that goes around the back and that's actually your stitch so you would count your v's like that so that's a stitch and there are little columns of stitches all one on top of the other and then you have your v's of your stitches going across to the side for your row so it's really useful to see this <clears throat> because it is um you kind of need to know how it's structured in order to mattress stitch it together but also to fix it so when you're doing mattress stitch you are looking along and actually you can tell I've used this a bit because it's been pulled out a little bit, but actually that's quite useful. I'm going to come a little bit closer as well as we do this. So with the mattress stitching, what you want is you have two columns of stitches. Your outside column, which is a little bit, in my case, it's always a little bit uneven. Most people, it's always because you're turning the row there and you're pulling in a slightly different direction. And then you have your sort of first set of really good V's. So your first column of perfect stitches, just one inside. And it's in those space between those, we call them ladders between your stitches, the little ladders that you have there. I'm going to put the needle right in, pull them apart so that you can see those up close. And it's into those that we're going to do the mattress stitch. So you find those on one side, so on your left, and you find them then on the corresponding piece on the other side. So this is a regular piece of stocking stitch. Now what some people do to make it easier is they knit every stitch. So you would knit on your knit rows and put, knit on your purl rows to get a really defined edge on those. Depends on how comfortable you are with it. It's good to know it for both ways. Sometimes I do it, sometimes I forget. <laughs> but basically you have your V of perfect stitches and then your outside column of stitches as well. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get myself a piece of thread. Uh, when I'm mattress stitching, I kind of, I, I suppose I go for about three times what I'm doing, but you can always do some more. I would like to have a nice elegant scissors, but they have all run off. <laughs> Typical. 
toddler's children are always shoeless. <laughs> so, <clears throat> thread my darning needle, just a regular piece. And the first thing that you're going to do is you are going to take your newly threaded yarn and you are going to take it into the very, the very bottom corner, just above your cast on edge. So that's the very first thing. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to link the two pieces of fabric. So I need to find the two holes on both of those. So they're matching. Now you come into them from the back. So I'm going to go in from the back. What did I do there? There we are, back again. Um, take this in from the back, all the way through. Leave yourself enough tail to sew in. So make sure you can sew that in. And then swap over and you're going to the other one. You're also going into the back here. So again, through that hole into the back and then you go back to the other side one more time and you come up through the same hole from the back as well and what that does is it creates a little figure of eight and that'll be pulled together to tighten those in together to make them into a really nice tidy piece together now I'm going to pull them out a little bit because I want to show you a bit more but that is the idea so you've joined them now together using the lowest point that you can on the two pieces of fabric. So I'm going to pull those up to show you. So you've created um, a piece of fabric that's joined together. So now the next thing you're going to do is the first place is you're going to go into and find your letters on this side. So I'm going to do two at a time. It's kind of an imprecise science, but you're looking for these letters. So I'm going to go into the first two there. You go in from front, underneath and up. And you can see why a curved ironing needle is quite useful because it kind of it sort of finds its own way through the fabric. So you go in that way up through and then you don't have to pull tightly we will pull later so then I take it over to the other side of my fabric I find my two little bits here so I find two ladders on this side and I go all the way through again and then I keep doing it so I go back to the other side find my two ladders poke around you can poke around a little bit and then up through those and then back to the other side and up through the two of those now you can also do it one at a time as well but i find that sometimes with the garment it can take forever if you're doing it two at a time or one at a time so let me show you if it's one at a time it would just be into here but actually two at a time kind of works now something to watch out for with the master stitch and i'll show you what to do now so the first thing before we learn how to fix this is that we're going to see it done is you draw it closed so it's really really neat all of a sudden it has disappeared and your stitches are right up against one another. So that's one of the really great things about mattress stitches that you can just then pull it together really nicely. And what it does is it creates a little seam at the back with your two salvage stitches. So your edge stitches at the back are hidden. You can see the different colored yarn, but normally you would um, you would sew with a different, you would sew with a similar colored yarn. One of the great things about using it as a method is that if you have a yarn that doesn't sew really well, so for example, if you have roving yarn that's kind of splitty, you can use any yarn of the same colour and you still won't be able to see it but you'll have to use something a little bit more robust. Now interesting thing about mattress stitches it is sometimes it is quite forgiving so for example if I say I skip one so say I'm a bit uneven let me make this a little bit uneven by kind of going up and down and I'm going to run out of stitches at say the top which I might well, I'm okay at the moment but say I kind of went astray and I might do one stitch here and then I've done two over here and I'm a bit ahead of myself on the left. So say I've just done a little bit of, so there now, there you'll notice that I'm beginning to run out of the left or the right because I haven't lined them up correctly because I've gone in too far. All you have to do is you would either go back if you're a perfectionist or go forward if you're me and then go into two on this side and then one into the side that you've just gone, you've, you're, running, you're running out of and then just pull them in together and you can see that they're going to come back together so if I do another two which will match the two sets of two I did on the other side then there and then go in one here it should adjust itself a little bit so that you can see that they're coming a little bit more together so it's quite a forgiving stitch and that they don't have to be perfectly lined up um, all the way up along and that is just mattress stitch so that is and then when you sew it off at the top again you're going to go right up to the top, right up to the very, very corner of the stitches up, up at the top, sew in your end, and then it's really easy to sew in. And another thing actually is I'm showing you how to sew in. Um, a lot of people, I, I was always inclined to do this, is that I would do this when I was sewing in my ends over, 
And what that does is it adds an extra layer of thickness to the seam when actually if you go in and out along the selvage, it's not quite as thick. Now you always end up with a thick seam. And you're probably wondering if I have a pattern and I'm leaving out two stitches on the edge of my stitches. Um, it's usually accounted for in patterns. So designers are always, your selvage stitches are normally worked into the size of your garment, so you won't be losing them. Plus even in a chunky sweater, you can see that you're losing, like you'd be worried about losing a centimeter because the gauge is very large, but actually that's been accounted for generally in the pattern. So that is mattress stitch. It's neat. Um, it's definitely, I used to put mine together and then I would just over sew them and they would just look so random. But once you have mattress stitch down, um, you get to put the rows really neatly up together. So that's mattress stitch. One of my favourite things It changed. Actually, when I learned how to do that, it changed how I felt about sewing up totally. Um, it's the kind of thing that once you know how to do it, you're good to go. So that is the first of them. If anyone has any more questions about those, let me know. The next thing I'm going to show you. So the next thing is going to be some helical knitting. So many of you will have worked in stripes or if you haven't, you uh, will at some point. So this is just regular striping where I am changing every round of colour. And you'll see that no matter what I've done, this is a really fine yarn. We have what we have, a little seam jog. It's ugly, but it is what it is. And you'll also see on the inside of this, you will see a row of where I'm carrying the yarn on the inside. And I've carried this quite tight, like so it's a bit of a mess. Um, so it's not perfect, but that is my seamed child color stripe in this sock however you will see that there is no join at all anywhere so that is no seams on the inside of the color actually i have a question let me have a quick look so daryl oh it matter is for for curves there is yes so in knit school, in finishing school, you will find a whole series of talking about the ratios. Let me go back actually and talk to you about that. So when you are sewing together, not the ratios, when you are sewing around corners and stuff like that, um, inserting a sleeve, for example, the way in which you're inserting your sleeve, it's much more relevant when you are matching up two uneven fabrics. So if I'm matching up, say I want to put uh, actually anything will do so if I'm putting this on so if I'm going this way against that um, you would need to do a ratio to make sure that your gauge is the same so that you can attach them at the same thing there is a whole series and I know both of you have joined Paula you've joined in school as well so there's a whole series on doing that also inserting a sleeve and picking up and knitting as well there's a particular way of doing it when you're joining particularly what a sort of a vertical to a horizontal fabric um, and a sleeve cap insertion is all about that um, and I cover that in knit school as well there's a whole video on a, an actual sleeve cap it is definitely one of those things that can go astray on you very quickly so yeah absolutely covered um, but there's definitely a special method to doing it now so back to this helical sock and there's no line on the inside I'm going to show you how to do it helical knitting is done on one round one ball so in this one I've actually used four balls because I've had to use one ball for each color in this but I'm going to show you how to do a single stripe version, which is what this looks like. So I'll show you this. So this is one stripe, one color, one stripe. So this is only two colors and this is four because they're double width. So I'm going to start with this and show you how to do this because the setup is the same for everything where you have three or more strands, but it's, this, it's different for those where you have just the two strands. So I'm going to start with the two strands and then move to the other one and show you that. So for this, I have, uh, yes, so on this one, I'm going to just show you very quickly. So I have here some yarn, <laughs> um, obviously, and I'm going to, so with the, I'm going to just show you, I'll show you the setup for all of them, set up for both, and then I'll show you the actual technique and how you change over using them all. Actually, and I've just discovered as I sit here <laughs> that I have not moved this on to the right place in the knitting. Let me do that. I think some of the setup for knitting workshops is like it's you you forget how quickly how you forget how long it takes to set everything up. So I've just taken this yarn and I've knit on a little bit from the center of round. It doesn't make a huge difference until you're doing uh, shaping in it. And I'm not going to do helical shaping tonight because it's a it's definitely a bit of a mind bend. Um, but all you're doing 
So I want to add a second color to my helical striping. Take my yarn, I knit up to a point, and then I literally add my color. So the way I add my color is I always knit one stitch together, working yarn above, tail yarn below, knit my stitch, and then continue working on in the color I want. And that is how I add my color, my second color for helical striping. And what I will do then is I'm going to knit all the way around and show you what happens when I do that. So we'll just do, if anyone has any questions while I do this, this will be awesome because this is just a little teeny tiny little going around circle here to show you. I think this is one of my favorite techniques that I've learned in the last kind of two years. Um, I learned it from Jen Arnold Culliford, who is an amazing designer and teacher kind of made it I don't know if it has made a comeback as such I don't know if it had ever made I, I don't know how it kind of you know the way some things just kind of catch and I caught in the last wee while and I've seen loads of people doing it and I just love it um it's really good for interchanging um hand dyed yarn skeins where you have where you want to say you're doing a semi-solid um so I knit up two two stitches before or three so you can either do two or three so when I'm using a double knit which is what this is Although I think this might actually be a four ply as well. If I'm doing a four ply or a DK, I'm going to use three stitches. If I'm using a chunky or anything else, I tend to use two. And the reason for that is that when you slip your stitches purlwise, so that's what you do when you knit up to the stitches, they come up purlwise. You give them a very gentle tighten, but you do not want to pull too much slack out of them. So I kind of use my third stitch when I'm knitting with very fine yarn to kind of mean that the whole thing doesn't become too tight, kind of carry a little slack in it. Um, and then you actually just start knitting again. Now I do have a tail here, so it's going to look a little bit funny, but I'm going to pull it out. So what you'll see now is that I've essentially spiraled up onto the pink. Now, if you want a more detailed masterclass on this, there's one in the Knit Matters Facebook group at the moment, and I cover this in Knit School as well. Um, but this is quite fun in that now I have no job, and you'll see the effect of how, how good that is in just a moment. Yeah, Paula, it's a funny one. It's it's some people call it helix knitting, spiral knitting, helical knitting. It's not it's kind of caught, but it's not me. It's kind of it's a little bit mainstream, but not everywhere. Um, it's definitely something I've kind of it's only been the last two years where I've really started using it. Um, but as I was saying on the last long round, <laughs> Um, if you have like a semi-solid yarn that you're mixing for a sweater and you want to interchange your skeins, I find it super for that because it doesn't create that line that you get when you're trying to interchange skeins down the side and it just gives you that little bit of smoothness. So you'll see now I'm back here to the start of this. Slip, 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 purlwise. Take up, drop your yarn, pick up your other yarn or your ball management will have to be very careful with this. And I'll show you that when I have three balls going for that. So I'm back here again little bit of tension don't pull too tight because you'll definitely see a little ridge in your knitting and then you just knit on and very quickly so now you can see I'm on here again knitting on top of my other pink and I'll actually be able to show you how helical knitting really works since I do a few more stitches so here I am I've started with my pink started here and I'm going all the way around. You see all the pinks. Pink, 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 pink. No break, no change, no nothing. Just a spiral of stitches. And that will continue on going all the way up along the garment in single colours like that. Now, that said, let me show you what that looks like in a bigger project so you can really see. So that's what it looks like in double colours. You can actually see it spiraling around and around where they actually never cat hair apologies um <laughs> everything in this house i always say i couldn't commit a crime because there have four different types of cat hair at the scene so you can see how they all spiral individually around um and that is one of the great things about it now just to talk through the setup for three colors uh let me see i won't rip back <laughs> what you're trying to do if you have three colors is what you want to do is you take your piece of knitting and instead of starting really close, so you you know where you knit up, join in, and then go continue on, you would come up to the first color, join it in, and then you would add your next color. It's you divide your stitches into three, so you would start, then you join in your other color about a third of the way around, 
and then you would go on another third and add your third color and then you would keep going around in a spiral like that the way you change colors is exactly the same but you would split off and do the different sections of it and every time you add a color you take your number of stitches divide by the number of balls that you want and then keep going and now the other thing then is if you want multiple stripes of the same color you have to have them together so if i wanted two of the gray i need two balls of the gray two balls of the pink two balls of the yellow there is obviously a um, maximum number of stitches you would want to use um but that's the general principle of it so that is that my dears uh, that is helical striping it is one of my favorite techniques i've actually <laughs> all of these patterns so they have all been written for it. The cowl, the Healy cowl, the Healy hat, the Healy socks, the double Healy socks. I might be a little bit obsessed. Um, and all of those patterns actually are all included in mid school because I am entirely enchanted by that technique. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you is um, I'm going to show you two different techniques because they're kind of sometimes people use them interchangeably and they're not all, they're sometimes interchangeable but they're not always so one of them is a three needle bind off which is a really lovely finishing method for shoulders and i'm also going to just show you the difference between that and grafting i'm going to show you this sweater so this is my simply the simplest sweater i love a simple sweater and you'll see that that is all mattress stitched along there along a visible seam that i wanted this is a three needle bind off shoulder so you can see that like mattress stitching sometimes can be really nice but actually having a three needle bind off as a shoulder is really quite a good idea because you a lovely slim seam on the inside it just gives you a little bit of a seam to give you that bit of strength that you want um but it's not it's not like bumpy like you might get if you were doing mattress stitch of course once you can mattress stitch correctly it's less of a worry but it is <laughs> not everybody wants to mattress stitch their shoulders together and it's one of the nice places to get a really good finish so let me show you how to get that finish. I'm going to start with the three needle bind off. Three needle bind offs are done right side against right side, which is the opposite to grafting, which is done wrong side to wrong side. Um, so yes, yeah, so I have right sides facing one another, pressed together, and then three needle bind off is literally what it sounds like. Let me find my needle. You would use a needle of the same size as the needles that you're casting off. I've been asked before if you can use a smaller or a larger needle. I would use a larger needle if I was doing it, um, just because you get slightly bigger stitches. If you cast them off a little bit, if you use a smaller needle to cast them off, it'll get quite tight. So if you don't have the right needle size, like you don't have a third of the two that you're using, then I would suggest using a fourth, or a larger needle at, you know, at, at best, at worst, you know, if you don't have the matching size. So. A three needle bind off is exactly like it sounds. I'm going to cast off using my three needles, but in exactly the same way as if I were doing any other cast off. So taking the tip of my needle, inserting knitwise into the first stitch as if I were going to knit it into the front loop of the other stitch. So I'm in through the front loops of both stitches, take them, knit them together, come back through, normal knit stitch, knit those together. Then the next thing I'm going to do so I'm going to knit my next stitch. I'm going to do a regular knit cast off, so nothing too fancy, so nothing stretchy or anything. Into the front two loops, knit the stitches together, single stitch, and then, like all cast offs, taking one loop over the other. And that is literally it. I wish it was magic. Into the front two loops, knit the two stitches together, take it over and off. Then again, now, I'd never tried this, and it's a funny one, so I'm going to do knit loop first off, first loop, knit stitch, and off. So I've not used this with, say, something like Jen's surprisingly starchy bind off, or um, any of the other loose cast off methods that there are. But I imagine I would, if you were going to try them and you wanted a slightly looser seam, I would think first about the strength you want in your seam, um, and why you're doing a seam there, because it might be that using a graft or using a looser cast off might not suit what you're doing but it might work really well as well so it really depends on the kind of context of what you're using it for um so now i'm going to keep casting off um another really useful use for this really useful use um is if you are doing short row shoulders so i don't know if anyone has seen them and they're another thing that i just they're also in finishing school um because when i started knit school i started with finishing school because i thought all those little neat things that you do um, they're what really make your knitting really perfect is um, 
short row shoulders. So it's where you shape your short rows. Instead of casting off the edges of your shoulders, you do them as short rows. So you get a whole series of stitches on an angle, which is what short rows do. And then you cast them off using a three needle bind off. So instead of having a kind of a lumpy shoulder that you try to seam together with mattress stitch so that it's double lumpy, you have lovely sort of straight edge of, of uh, short rows and uh, you bind them off together and they're such a neat look. Now I'm not going to cut this because I need this piece again. So I'm just going to pull it through as if I were going to bind it off. And then I'm going to show you what that looks like on the outside. So that is that piece of fabric put together super, super neatly. So you can see how that would work really well on a set of shoulders. Um, and you can use that in lots of other contexts as well. Um, but it is very commonly used in shoulders. I've used it in toys for seaming the backs of toys and stuff like that. Um, and it's great. Now the difference between that, and I'm going to show you how to do mattress stitch as well, is just so that you can see the difference between them. So that is a seam. And seams are often in garments. We've, we've become kind of obsessed with knitting on their own with no seams. And I, I am a huge fan of no seams. But there are times when a seam is necessary for strength. It's just to point out that this does give you that seam to give you that bit of strength. So put those aside because I'm going to show you the difference between those and a, a graft. Now apologies for having these on some weird needles, but it'll be fine. So think about, yep, that works. So if you've seen the toe of a sock, this is called Kitchener stitch or grafting. So really you're just going to bring them together. So I'm going to show you this in a darker yarn because you'll be able to see exactly the difference between them. And you'll also see why grafting is so effective for joining shawls and all sorts of other bits and pieces as well. So dark yarn, your two bits of yarn together and they are wrong side to wrong side. So they are different. They're the opposite of your graft of your apologies. They're the opposite of your three needle bind off. So I have my yarn ready to go. Now, first thing you do is you set up. So what I do when I'm grafting is I think knit, knit, no, knit, purl, purl, knit, knit, purl, purl, knit. <laughs> Whereas actually when you start, it's purl and then knit. Sorry, that was probably really confusing, but in my head it's right. So the first thing you do is, do, sorry, first you do the setup. And the setup is like this. You put your needle purl wise into the front stitch on the front needle, first stitch on the front needle, take it through. And normally you would be using the yarn, you would often be using the yarn that you had, um, you were knitting with, but I'm going to leave a little tail to sew that in because I want to show you these separately. But let's pretend that I've pulled it in nice and tight as if it were this. So in purlwise, then you go back to the first stitch of the second needle at the back and you go in knitwise. So you go into the stitches if you were going to knit it with your darning needle. So knitwise. And that's it. That is your grafting setup. So your kitchen stitch setup is purl and then knit into the back and now you're ready to graft so you take your needle you insert it knitwise this time into the first stitch and you slip it off so it comes off your needle you then bring your needle all the way through and then you insert it purlwise into the next stitch the second stitch on the front needle and leave it on you then go back to the second needle and go through the first stitch purlwise and slip it off and then you go through the next stitch knitwise and leave it on and that's why I think to myself knit purl purl knit 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 purl purl knit it's always the same you kind of get into a rhythm of it yourself there are people with rhymes etc for it but this is my way it's just like so it's knit off purl on many many tails <laughs> very gently pull it up then back into the other stitch so purl and then knit and that's your whole maneuver so it, it, for each one now, I'm not going to pull too tightly but you would keep it about even you want to get a nice even tension on it you can even it out afterwards and I'll show you that in a second so again we're back to the my st set up again my stitches again so it's knit and off purl and on and you give all your attention to the front needle and then all your attention to the back. So purl and then knit. And again, that's your four finished. And I find if you're working on this, always finish the four stitches because otherwise I've had to cut the toes out of socks because I've forgotten where I am. <laughs> so it's knit, purl wise, knit wise, no, apologies, purl wise, knit wise. So it's the reverse on the back as it is in the front. And then that, that graft together. 
I keep going up. This is pretty slow, but I, I have to say this is such a good technique. It's a knit pearl, pearl, knit. Another place you'll often see this technique is in place of like a provisional cast on. So if you have two pieces of a shawl that you have been um, knitting from, so say you're knitting from the cast on edge and it has a nice rippled edge, but you can only get that by knitting in one direction. So you want them both to match, but if you knit from one end to the other, you can't have that effect because the other the casting off edge won't look like the cast on edge. And you'll often use grafting to graft the two pieces together in the center so that they're identical to one another. Um, so it gives you that really lovely symmetry, particularly on shawls and stoles and all sorts. Um, other places you see it, uh, all sorts of places. So like um, sock toes, it's because it's seamless and you'll see why in just a moment and I'm hoping I'm doing this correctly because it's when you're talking it's definitely one of those things it's a bit like when you're counting you also when you're doing mattress stitch you're like please don't talk to me <laughs> now I'm talking to myself and you all while I'm doing it and I'm like oh will we make it we're nearly there now so then I come to the last two stitches last two stitches and then you can literally finish these as you would your beginning so you knit off off or off as well and that is your graft now let me show you now my stitches are probably a little bit funny now there what you have done and this is the neat thing about doing it in a different color yarn is that what you have done is you have put an extra row of stitches to graft your two pieces together and there is no seam at all so you can just imagine what that looks like if you have the same color yarn it is entirely invisible at the top of wherever you're putting it. So that's why right here, sock toe, that's a graft. So you really can't, you can tell because there's wings on the toe, but you can see that there's no, there's a direct, con you know, it continues on, which means that there's no rubbing on the inside of the sock. Whereas if you were to use something like this, to be able to bind off, you would have a rough edge. You definitely don't want that in any of your, you know, on a sock toe, etc. And again here, you can see why that's seamless and really smooth and it works really well on things that should, you know, like shawls, etc., where you don't want a set of a bumps. Now you can also see why this might not work as well, where you have a seam because it's just knitting. So over time, if you were using this to be depending on the top of your shoulder where the whole garment is resting on it, it might be over time it might pull. So if you are substituting this in for a three needle bind off or anything, just be aware that it's they aren't always they can be used in some circumstances the same, but not all of them. So that is three needle bind off and a three needle bind off and a graft. Now, I'm going to borrow another little piece. This one. <laughs> so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a little bit about picking up and knitting, but knitting into the back of them. I'm also going to show you a small bit of a cheat as well uh, for swatching in the round that I wasn't planning to cover, but I need to cover it in order for this to make sense. So. Um, when you're picking up and knitting along an edge, again, you're actually doing it into the same place as you are mattress stitching. So I tend to do it one column of stitches in and into the um, little holes. Now, with those, because I'm going to be coming out this way from it, I would do it as a ratio. I think it's three is to four. So for every four rows, I pick up three stitches. Uh, yes, that is it. <laughs> but generally, if you want to be really, really precise, you would do two swatches and compare them and then work out your maths like that. Again, something I cover in detail in finishing school is the ratios of how to pick those up and how to kind of do really good uh, button band pickups, etc. So I should do that a bit quick. Into the bottom hole, I hold my yarn underneath as if it was like part of the garment to give myself a bit of tension and knit through. And let me do that again so that you see what I'm actually doing. You go right through from front to back knit your stitch and pick it up. I'm going to pick up three. So what I'm doing is when I say three, I mean knit one, move over a bar, knit one, move over a bar, knit one. And then when I say three and skip one, I'm going to skip across this bar here. And then I'm going to go into the one above it. So I'm going to be that precise this time. Let me see where I'm going to go in there. I'll just be sure. I'm picking this upside down, I think I'm on. Anyway. It's not the purpose of this method. <laughs> so yeah, I've one, two, three. Let's do a bit of rooting around. Oh, I can see why I'm rooting around as well because at the back I have sewn in my tail and I'm fighting my tail. 
So don't swing your tails until you've picked up a knit. And again, I'm going to skip one. So there's my the gap there that I'm going to skip. And then I'm going to pick up another three down along here. One, two, three. And this ratio is why you often, when you are trying to pick up along a pattern that the, knit, the designer has said, pick up X number of stitches along your band, but your gauge is a little bit off. So you can't get the same number as they have. And that is all down to um, the pickup ratios that you're using. Um, but I'm going to show you what, what I'm really showing you in this is knitting into the backs of them so that you get that effect. So what I've done is I've just picked up enough stitches to kind of show you the technique. Um, and I am now going to, I'm going to purl into the backs of them. It'll show you the same effect. So if I had just picked up a set of stitches and I was, I'm going to purl half of them uh, regularly and then I'm going to purl into the backs of them to show you the slight difference between them. I should have a stitch mark for this, but I, like everything, I do not have one. <laughs> when I need one. My entire house is covered in stitch markers. Let me just get one. Um, this board pin might fit this. You can always pin it into the fabric anyway. So let's do it. So three, 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 and three. So I'll just put the pin into the fabric there so you can see the difference between them. I'm now going to turn my work. I'm going to purl into the, I'm going to purl the first six, just regular, as if I were doing a regular pick up and knit stitch. So I'm just going to purl these. So just purl those as, as normal. And now I'm going to go in here and I'm going to purl into the backs of these. So I'm going to purl into the back. Now if I was doing this, I would knit into the backs of them. This is just purling into the back. And this is just a really tiny, tiny thing that when you're picking up necklines, armholes, bands, anything at all, it gives you just a little bit more strength. And you'll see why. So if I pull this out, you can see that there are little gaps in there where I haven't twisted the stitches on this side. But where I've twisted the stitches on this side, there are less gaps. It's just a little added piece of strength for your fabric. Literally all you do, and it's why you get a lot of gapping in socks. So again, it's a technique you would use when you're picking up the gusset on a sock, knitting it into the back. So your picked up stitches on the first row gives you a really, really good finish. The tiniest technique in the world. Um, in the same way that if you're doing slip slip knits in a sock and you knit into the back of your slip slip knits, you get a much better line of slip slip knits than if you don't do that. So that's another teeny tiny thing. And the very last thing tonight, one of my favourites, is knitting in your ends as you go. I'm going to do this pretty quickly because I imagine people have a ton of knitting to be getting on with. So, all you're doing, and I have a couple of blankets actually, I'll show you in a second when we go back. Let me reach for it actually. This is a blanket where I did not pick up my ends as they was knit. So it's great for times like this when, um, this is my Blame It on the Buggy blanket again, a pattern included in my school. Um, and this is just ends that were never picked up as I went. And this one on the other hand, and it's very difficult to tell. Let me see if I can find them. This was knit in as I went. So all of those were all knit in as I went through them. So it makes a huge difference. And obviously I'm carrying my yarn in one stitch from the outside as well, which makes it very almost invisible from the other side. So a super useful technique, particularly if you make a lot of things with blankets, etc. So what I'm gonna do, just find myself some thread. I should really get a slightly less soft yarn, although this alpaca is magnificent. So I don't know, I love knitting with it, it's such a treat. So all I'm gonna do now, is again because I like to just knit my stitch. I'm going to knit them together in another way so that people who are more familiar with this. So when I'm knitting in a yarn, again I hold it to give attention, I could knit my two stitches together. Which means then I'm going to want to hide my blue. So we'll pretend this is a tail uh, rather than anything else. So all you do is you have your yarn from above that you're going to be knitting with. And you have the yarn that you want to hide the tail of. I take the yarn that I want to hide the tail of over the tip of the needle like that. I then knit the stitch as normal. Then take my yarn back over. And then I finish my knit stitch. I then knit my next stitch normally. And then I put my tip in, bring it over, round and down. And it catches the stitches. So I'm gonna do that a little bit more slowly now. So I knit my next stitch as normal. So it's every second stitch. I then take the yarn that I'm trying to tie in, bring it over the needle, press it down the needle, 
pick the yarn and go properly around it so it's the, when you're bringing over the blue yarn it's the opposite way and you knit those together and you knit the next stitch you take your other thing over the front of the tip of the needle so it's over it instead of under it knit it bring it back catch it and then it normally then it just catches it and that is literally how you tie, you weave in as you go. You can just see that the blue yarn will be held all along there and if I were to cut it here, then it would just be all sewn in for me. The other way of doing it, and the one problem with that is that if the yarns are very high contrast, you might see one yarn showing through the other. So a way around that is to just twist, knit, twist, knit, twist. Now you're probably thinking, why would you use the other so why would you use one above the other? If you are someone who's used to doing continental knitting, it's actually very, very easy to catch the, the yarn like that. Um, and it's also, if you're doing floats and stuff like that, a reason you would, you know, it's, it's very comfortable to use the one over your left finger if you're used to it. And that's it. You can see that your yarn has been sewn all the way in along the back of your work, just like that. So there's two different methods for sewing in your ends. And that is, if anybody has any questions, that is pretty much uh, five different things with a few other little tiny tips that you can uh, work through to just improve the finish of your knits just that little bit. Now I'm going to swap over to the camera and tell you a teeny tiny bit about knit skills. Um, and then I am going to leave you to the rest of your evening. So thank you so much for staying with me. Um, I'm so delighted there were so many people. Um, so that was really, really, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope that was really useful. It is one of my favorite things is finishing and how you kind of finesse your knits. I took a finishing course. I don't know, I keep saying like, I say between five and 10 years ago, cause I'm not entirely sure of the date. Um, it must be at least, it must be eight or nine now. And in that we covered blocking, shaping, finishing, increasing, decreasing, um, seaming, grafting, all those kinds of things that you don't always learn and you don't always know what you don't know. And it was one of the reasons when I started knit school is that I started with finishing because it's one of those things that even if you're just a beginner knitting a knitter, it's really nice to know. And if you're an advanced knitter, there's always something new to learn. Because I remember taking that class and I was thinking, sure, I can knit. But obviously it's not one of those, you know, it's not always that obvious. So I know I'm being um, joined by lots of people who are members. So hi, guys. Uh, so Laura, would it be? Op yes, it will. So my plan for Knit School is to open before we start a major set of master classes. So at the moment, there are eight master classes in Knit School, including finishing school, sock school, color work and sticking. Um, and we're about to start a, a beginner's lace and advanced lace with Bona Miss Kelly, who is an amazing designer and teacher. But I plan to open. Um, we'll be opening again. So we're opening this month and next month, then we're having a month off. <laughs> and then we'll be back um, just before we start doing brioche. So we're gonna have a brioche in August and then we're gonna have advanced brioche in September. So we'll have August and September will be brioche month. So we'll be opening again in July uh, for people who wanna start with those. Um, there is an annual membership option though that gives you, you get 12 months for the price of 10 and you get all of the master classes that are there and an extra pattern library as well so you can kind of it depends on your own pace but we will open again um it's not it's not like it is it's an exclusive club once you're in but it's not it's not impossible to get in who would do that <laughs> um but we open for a week it'll be a week at the end of the month that we're opening um because it means that when we then start the following month i'll have more time to spend with people who join um so that you guys get a proper welcome to knit school as well so yeah, Laura, I will definitely be open again um, towards the end of the year. And I think the price will be pretty static now um, for the rest of the year until um, until I back register later in the year, at which point the price will increase. But I will give loads of people loads of notice of that as well. Um, so yes, and that's it. Um, if anybody has any other questions, you can always tag me in this and ask any questions you can. If you are interested in joining Knit School or even just finding out more about it, you can go to knitschool.co.uk. Right now, there's a link at the front of the site and it'll be there until Friday that you can join now. Have a little bit of a look around. Um, or you can also join the mailing list if you want to fancy, if you fancy doing it later on. And don't worry, once you click on the join now button, you do get like loads of time to make a decision. It's not one of those things that like randomly signs you up or anything. So that's it, my dears. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. I'm very excited to be here. I love, 
I just I love knitting. I love sharing it with people and I like I like those things that make it just that little bit easier. And there are so many of them, like so many little things. And even since I started knit school just under a year ago, I have learned so many things about knitting. It's so amazing. Like you never you never finish learning it. So it's awesome. So my dears, thank you ever so much for joining me and um have a lovely rest of the evening. Oh, sorry, I should finish quickly. <laughs> You can join me tomorrow evening if you miss this you're kind of catching the tail end of it you can rewatch it but i'm also doing the same class in uh, for the love of yarnigans with lisa harland tomorrow um so we're going to talk to her folk in her facebook group so if you're not a member of that you can pop in there and join me again but you will be seeing a repeat of this or then on wednesday i am live with abby in the luxury yarns or kidding luxury yarns facebook group so luxury yarns group i think you search for um i'll be posting about that tomorrow i'm gonna to be doing fixing your knits so ways of picking up and fixing lots of different things um so when things go wrong how to fix them will be the whole plethora of it because there are lots of things that you could you could go wrong but there's also some ways to kind of prefix your work as well so we're we'll covering that on wednesday i'm live as well tomorrow brona miss kelly on instagram at noon so you can come and see us we're talking about what's in the lace master classes so if lace is something you fancy this is definitely the time to join knit school she's going to start at the like the most basic level with even including how to do a yarn over which I think is just a great place to start when you're really setting out with lace because it can be very intimidating and Brona is going to make it so that it is not and then I'm also joining uh, Sarah from Yarn Blarney on Friday on Instagram as well and we're going to talk about what it's like to be a crocheter in knit school because it's not just for knitters you guys are most welcome if you're crocheters as well um, so yes my dears again apologies I'm always like I'm like the PS <laughs> this this but that really is it now i must go and do a bit of sock knitting so take care my lovelies have a really good evening and thank you so much for your time thank you for listening